I'm going to talk about a very chill and um, relaxing topic, which is race and racism. Uh, so just starting the evening off with some easy listening. Um, I think it's an essential topic, a crucial topic, an urgent one, and, and shockingly one that I actually didn't have a lot of experience in. Um, I'd been teaching for 10 years in all of the subjects that you just heard about and never really focused on the particular operation of race. So some of what I'm going to do today is just kind of take you through my own learning process um, from thinking about race as something that's natural, something that we're born with, right? We're always sort of checking a box that says we're in one of four or five different distinct categories. Um, but in fact, historians and cultural theorists and scientists have long challenged the tidiness of racial boxes. We think of these boxes actually as framings decisions about how to categorize people. So the reality is that we're not so much born with a race as we're born into race. And it's the fiction of race that leads to the fact of racism. Sociologists like Joe Feagan explained that in the 18th century, so this is quite an old concept that has a history, um, in the 18th century, race generally came to mean how we sometimes still use it today, a category of human beings with distinctive physical characteristics transmitted by descent and set in a clear hierarchy developed in Europe to serve the needs of enslavement and empire. It's no surprise really that, uh, that white people ended up on the top and, uh, and black indigenous people um, on the bottom. But the essential point is that race is social, a set of popular beliefs about human differences. And it is in itself inherently racist. It's selfish, it's hungry, and it doesn't share. I first met this idea in graduate school and it didn't really take hold for a variety of reasons. Um, but it was through this debate about taking race, the word, and putting it into uh, quotations. And one of the resistance to it, I think, was how do you then form a sense of belonging? Would it mean that you lost a sense of a people? Um, when we start putting these quotations around race. So on the one hand, we're trying to hold this idea of belonging, but then the reality is also really that we're 99.9% uh, the same. And yet, we live in a society that teaches us to treat each other as though we're 99.9% .9 different from each other. Sometimes it can feel convenient to say something like, well, I don't see race, and that's a way to deal with racism. But actually, we need to understand the particular mechanisms and operations of race, the varieties um, of racisms, in order to fully understand each other's histories, our feelings about those histories, in order to address the problems that we face together, together. What fascinates me about race is the way that it's like this illusion that's, that we walk into or that's put upon us that has a, like a tidy sort of category, um, but then is super messy to actually live with. Um, I think it's probably messy for white people. I think it's super messy for those of us who are racialized. Even just standing here underneath all of these lights, like I can't really see anyone, so I feel quite visible, but also very vulnerable at the same time. But this is basically how I live. <laughs> that, is, that is my life. Um, just kind of visible, vulnerable, trying to catch up with, um, with, my, own, with my own story. Um, I'll share with you something that actually I had forgotten about until we started working on what would I bring to my community here in Bloomington and what would I bring to the TEDx audience. So I was in graduate school, University of Chicago, it's cold, whatever, and I went home, you know, as we know, Midwest, 
um, the hawk was always out. So I was home, I think, in December, um, you know, jogging as, you know, as one does, um, minding my own business, you know, looking at, oh, magnolias, oh, palm trees, this person put in roses, reminiscing about um, when I was on the crew team in college and how, um, you know, how my coach would like be mad at me because I wouldn't train enough. Um, and I was always kind of jogging in this super languid um, way and he wanted me to be more of a, I don't know, why you saying bold type or whatever. Um, and I just wasn't that person, you know, I was just there because I like water and getting up early. So in thinking about all of this, I know, which sounds, I know, but I am, I like the dawn, whatever, I, you know, I'm a poet, I was an English major, um, so I was just out there, ooh, orange blossoms, so I'm having these kinds of thoughts, you know, back home and jogging and everything, um, and then all of a sudden, I'm stopped dead in my tracks by a snarling dog. The next thing that I remember is a sheriff at my door. That's what we call them in Florida. The sheriff is at my door. And he's telling me that whosoever dog that was um, sent their animal after me because they said I was running up their driveway and trying to get into their garage. And that's really all I remember about this sort of incident, jogging, sidewalk, dog, sheriff. I was blank. And racial trauma kind of filled in the rest of it. Uh, this feeling of suspension, kind of in a falling building, kind of waiting for it to hit, um, this kind of doubling of yourself where you're suddenly aware that who you think you are and who other people think that you are are actually two quite different Entities. You couldn't really say two different people, but just two different, um, two different entities. And yet, over time, I have reflected on this dynamic, right, where you're confronting other people's ideas about you, and deciding that you know either I can be stuck in this running against myself or running away from myself. Um, this image that is not at all like me, but kind of looks like me in like a monstrous way. Um, or I can just get out, just leave, just stop dealing with these clowns and the kind of chaos that they are bringing into my life. And so, although it's interesting, like it was in graduate school that I was introduced to the chaos of race and kind of hid from it in a certain way, um, even though I was having these racialized experiences. Um, and then it was here, actually teaching at IU and teaching a course on race and media that I was able to then get a hold of these operations and to just kind of find like my one sort of true religion, you know, which is really simply learning things, inquiry, right? Um, and with the liturgy of that being writing, right? I'm a big believer in just doing what you can control. We can't control these other people. In this religion of mine, uh, which you heard about the Black Film Center Archive, I have saints, I have muses, um, I have women of incredible invention that I surround myself with, and they make a kind of force field of um, our own kinds of messiness, our own kind of power, our own kinds of fiction and invention. They show me that you can't really just chain yourself to the opinion of somebody who's trying to murder you. And racism is not about me. The tidiness of research and teaching, the preservation that we do, the programming, is not actually enough, though. It's not enough to be right. It's not enough to be respectable. You do need to get messy with the inquiry. Cascades of questions about why this, who this, why now, right? That really open up our understanding of the categories that shape all of our lives. And whenever these dogs come barking, I return to this same liturgy. 
to question from the Latin meaning to, to seek, right? To be on a quest, an amateur. From the French amour, to love, and curate. From the Latin to care. So to love, to care, to care for, and to be on a quest. Because race isn't neutral. It's hungry, it's fictional, and it's messy. But so am I. <laughs>